Here we go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to everyone joining us Live. Welcome to the American Theatre Wings Network panel. Uh, panel is, of course, titled Pivot and Rethink, Producing Behind the Screen. Before we jump into this panel, uh, we just want to take a moment to introduce ourselves and give a brief overview on what the network is. Uh, so my name is Melissa Cabrero, and I'm one of the program associates here at the Wing. And hello, I am Alicia Vaninchak. I am uh, the other programs associate at the American Theatre Wing. Just to give a little overview of the network and uh, the program's mission and uh, its raison d'etre. <laughs> I, I just broke out some French. Um, the network is one of the edu educational programs at the Wings. Uh, at the Wing, it's one of many educational and professional development programs we do. Um, the mission of the program is to create a a supportive, creative community where aspiring theater administrators, students, interns, young professionals can connect with panels of seasoned professionals, theater companies, and other major players in the New York theater scene uh, just to learn about all the different administrative and behind the scene jobs and careers that are available to young people who want to embark in a career in the theater. Um, some previous panel topics have included new work development, community outreach programming, social media management, and uh, a whole bunch of other great behind the scenes jobs that we've highlighted in the past. Um, being a member of the network is just to be linked to other like-minded individuals um, and to gain access to these exclusive panels, events, seminars, um, which are all designed to help you, the people attending these meetings, to advance your careers. Um, and we are so thrilled to be able to support, educate, and nurture the next generation of theater professionals through uh, the network. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing from the panelists um, who are just, we're going to introduce, we're, or we will introduce, um, but these panelists, guys, in just over a month, uh, put together timely, relevant, and inspiring programs and events, um, and we're going to be learning about all the behind-the-scenes logistics it took to make that happen, and so we are thrilled uh, to be able to have a conversation with them tonight. And so it's our hope that you're able to take these stories, resources, and administrative skills shared in this panel and utilize them for yourselves to produce events within your own communities. Um, and so um, we're going to br briefly introduce each panelist just to maximize our time with them. Um, and so without further ado, let's just jump in. Uh, joining us this evening, and if you can give us a wave uh, when we introduce you, we have Coleman Ray Clark, Deputy Director of 24-Hour Plays, who's actively involved in their viral monologue series now in its seventh round. Big congrats. <laughs> Also joining us is Douglas Ramirez, Director of Special Events and Performances with the Actors Fund, who has produced programming such as Plays in the House, Hum Day with Hampshire, and many more. And uh, rounding out tonight's panel is Rachel Sussman, uh, one of the producers uh, who worked on the Saturday Night Seder, which has raised over $3 million for the CDC Foundation. And of course, uh, those in intros were very brief, that, and that's just a part of what you all do and work on. So if you have other projects or works in development that you feel would be relevant to tonight's conversation uh, and discussion, please feel free to share uh, that as well. Um, but before we jump into the specifics of your recent projects, um, just for our folks watching who might be less aware of what the role of a producer is or just only know it from the movie The Producers, perhaps. Uh, what is the what and how of the role of a producer from your point of views? And we'll jump off starting with Coleman. And Okay, hi. Um, thanks. So the, um, the what and how. I mean, um, specifically right now, I think um, uh, producing is about well, maybe not specifically right now, maybe always. It's, a, it's about getting creative um, and, and storytelling, um, but it, getting creative in the way that um, it's getting the people and the, and the needed resources together, which that feels very specific to now. Um, 
or, or more essentialized to know. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll go to Douglas next. I'd have to agree. It's a matter of figuring out a way how to use resources and, and acquire those resources, but also in a creative way, specifically since we're doing everything virtually now, you know, working with everyone's calendars and, and just also the technology, really learning how to utilize the technology in a way that will be engaging to the, in, to the audience who you're really trying to get to, to come back to what it is that you're creating and be, and be invested. Awesome. And Rachel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, the same. I mean, it's allocating, locating resources and opportunities, but it's also, you know, I really think of the producer as the CEO in a lot of ways and responsible for managing expectations of everyone involved and making sure communication is very clear. Great. That's awesome. Thank you for that overview. Yeah. And so now jumping into specifics, so each, for each of the programs and events that you worked on, you didn't do it alone, right? Um, so you're part of wonderful teams um, that required you to divide and conquer. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can just describe to us um, what your responsibilities were specifically um, in your respective processes. And we can kick it over to Rachel. Sure. Um, I was one of three producers on the Saturday Night Seder, but our team was much larger. I mean, we had five executive producers. Um, I know one of my producing partners, Jen Snow, is watching right now. And, um, you know, we sort of uh, assigned based on our skill set where in the producing process we were going to um, uh, be responsible. So I um, generally take on a lot of <laughs> Leslie Nope qualities and I spent a lot of time doing organization um, and in particular um, creating a run a show document that would help to really lay out the flow of the evening as well as be able to translate what the artists, the, the musicians and the writers had done with the script into a format that the editors and others could read and then utilize to create the content. Awesome. Uh, Douglas, let's hear from you. Well, I mean, I'd have to say my role is a little bit different, I think, probably because at the Actors Fund, we right now have a multitude of um, activations that are happening all over the country. Um, a lot of people are coming to me and they're and they're kind of just first starting to give me the ideas. I mean, I have to I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, Stars in the House and Plays in the House are really Seth Rudesky and James Wesley. They have really put together a team to create all of that content. Um, talking with us when it initially was starting off, uh, so they really kind of have hit the ground running. But there are other things like Hump Day with Hampshire that is all an internal team and it's exactly that it's just a matter of making sure you have everybody on board that knows what they're doing and makes it all very seamless um, but again a multitude of activations not just those two that kind of have me going in multiple directions all day which is a wonderful thing to have <laughs> and for myself for the 24-hour uh plays viral monologues um it, it mostly started with myself and my uh, kind of co-producer, Madeline Paquette, and our artistic director, Mark Armstrong. Um, when, we, when we did the first round, um, so we're, we're always in the 24-hour plays everywhere we go. The first round of these um, was the Monday and Tuesday after the Thursday that Broadway shut down. Um, that was truly a 24-hour play. So it was like Monday at 8 a.m. we started, and, and that's when the kind of task list, like Rachel was saying, um, was broken up between the three of us and we figured out who who we needed on our team. Um, so for myself, that was a lot of, um, and that was and continues to be um, a lot of task breakup and, and sorting and scheduling. Um, and then also the artistic side of taking the scripts, first thing from the writers, going through the scripts and kind of prepping them for editing, doing some of the editing and now less of the editing, um, and then kind of prepping them for the that night. So a lot of the back end, like after the writers and or writers and actors are paired together, that's what I do. Great. Um, and also, I just want to add, I would be remiss not to say that the Saturday Night Seder was the brainchild of Benj Pasek and Adam Cantor of StoryCourse. And so 
they had this idea and then sort of brought along all of their incredible um, brilliant friends to to join them and helping to bring it to life. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And our Q&A is already off and, and running. Um, we have a question from Heather Arders. Um, and the question is, what platform works best for recording and virtual presentation in your experiences? Um, I'm not sure if anyone has something off the bat, if you just want to take off and, and answer that. Um, I think Coleman has an idea. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, so for us, we chose Instagram TV. Um, and I'll say that because I don't think there is a best option. I, th I think it really depends on your like artistic goals and where you're hoping to engage with people and, and in what ways. So for us, we knew that we would have videos that were from somewhere from like two minutes to 10 minutes long. Um, and that we wanted people to engage with them kind of quickly and, and to like, um, be able to share them quickly. And so Instagram TV became that platform as opposed to something like YouTube or, um, or even Facebook, which now we're cross posting to. So, um, but, but I would say really it's specific about the type of project you're looking, looking for. And maybe like in, in similar ways to finding a theater in New York, you would find a theater based on like all kinds of different factors about what you're doing and who you're hoping will show up there. I think it's kind of similar for me. I would say probably the same thing. It's a matter of what's the audience that you're trying to get to. Um, we have things that we've put up through YouTube. I'd say uh, one of the streaming platforms that we actually find very helpful is StreamYard. Uh, that seems to work very clean for the type of work that we do that you can bring people in and out very smooth instead of having a Zoom recorded um, type of event, which also works. It depends on what your, your audience is. And then another one that works for us that I was surprised is uh, unique is Tiltify. Tiltify we're actually using right now for Broadway Jackbox, which is Andrew Barth Fellman is doing that for us where they are basically playing a game and uh, people are watching, but it's uh, it's really kind of fun. If you haven't watched, watch, I'm telling you, it's, it's really <laughs> funny. Um, but they get a lot of people to come on there and they're all their friends from Broadway and they're playing Jackbox. But the thing about Tiltify is that you, as a somebody who's viewing the game can interact with the people playing the game. So it's an opportunity for a fan to interact directly with the talent. And they seem to really enjoy that interactivity. And it's really, but that's also gauging more towards a younger demographic, which seems to work very well for that specific one. But to your point, Coleman, it's a matter of understanding who's your audience and who you're trying to engage with. I agree. Um, we used Zoom and StreamYard in creating the Seder as well as simple iPhone video. Um, but the other thing that uh, we did was we worked with our entire team um, to partner with uh, BuzzFeed Tasty. And I'm working on another event this coming week that's in partnership with Refinery29. So being able to think about your primary demographic and then what other demographics could potentially work with you, bring in a different audience, how can you partner with them? And perhaps that's, you know, for us, it was the YouTube channel um, for BuzzFeed Tasty, as well as having the link embedded on our Saturday Night Seder um, site online. Great. Awesome. Those are great answers. And um, just moving on to the next question that we have in our Q&A here, um, and this one's coming from Andrea Whitney. Uh, what kind of skills and jobs do you look for, or rather job experience, do you look for when looking to hire or choose an intern? Hmm. So a little bit more of a generalized question, right? Um, but I think this is a really important uh, thing to answer if, if you have any sort of insider feedback, just because this is actually coming from someone working within high school, and I'm sure their, their students have questions for them about that. Um. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go. Um, in terms of skills, and I'm, when I work with interns, and I'm always interested in, in mentorship, um, I know Coleman is as well, um, I'm, I'm looking for folks who are willing to sort of get their hands dirty and say yes and sort of try and figure it out, not necessarily um, ask a hundred questions about how to get there, but maybe um, try on their own, try and sort of like see what works, what doesn't work, and then have a conversation about it. Someone who's really curious and wants to learn more and always looking to go a little bit of, above and beyond, and that makes my job easier. It helps sort of build that trust, and then I feel 
really comfortable and confident in um, delegating more to that person. That. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Just a, yep, I agree. <laughs> I'd say also, um, for me, it's finding somebody who has a passion for what it is that they're looking to do within within the, the community. Uh, a perfect example is I'm, I'm currently working with a young woman who is 13 years old from Southern California who decided she wants to do a fundraising event for us. And I just happened to ask her, you know, well, depending on what kind of music or anything that you're going to use, you're, you're, you're going to need to be getting the rights to use that. Her response to me was not to worry. I already reached out to ASCAP and I'm talking to theater authority about getting, and I, I almost fell out of my chair. This is a 13 year old woman who knew exactly what she needed to do. And to me, that really stood out. So, you know, people who really understand the industry, understand what they're wanting to do, it really resonates and it comes through very, very clearly. Um, another question uh, we have from Jeffrey Nunez. Um, what are you guys what are your guys' roles in terms of getting funding for these projects and how do you pitch your ideas? I can answer on on, on this one. It's a little bit different right now. <laughs> so for for us specifically at the Actors Fund, I'm very fortunate that we're not actually looking for funding for these activations because they are all going to COVID-19 relief efforts. So people are coming to us and are doing it pro bono including the talent, the editors, you know, everybody who's doing it. So we're very, very fortunate mm -hmm. to do that. But yes, when it's not in this situation and we're actually creating content, I'm very involved, I have to say, in talking to anybody who might be from our major donors who might be interested in supporting this, to talking to corporate entities and trying to figure out what would be the appropriate brand connection to what it is that I'm trying to do. I have to be very conscientious about not going back to the same people constantly, but making sure that I'm, I'm aware of what it is that we're creating and how it's that, that's gonna resonate with that specific brand. So you have to take your own brand into consideration with the brand that you're approaching. I can say I wasn't directly involved with the fundraising on the Seder, um, but we worked with an organization called Reboot, um, which provided some of the funding we needed, but similar to Douglas, we've had a lot of folks who in particular with many celebrities involved in the Seder who were so generous in giving of their time and energy to participate. Um, but I'm also working on other events where we've been able to raise funds to pay everyone. And that's always my preferred way of working just to give everyone even just a stipend as a show of a, a token of your, um, a gesture to everyone for what they've done for you. Awesome. Yeah, similarly, I was I was not directly um, um, a part of it, but but I will say that for the 24 hour plays, we were just about to go into a series of podcasts that we were launching um, that we had to cancel and um, as well as the 24 hour musicals, which were canceled. And so the kind of like spin of canceled events um, has been it, so our budget um, really has been a more of a reallocation assignment than a direct like seeking funding for this project it's been more about how to shift an organization towards new online programming that fits a mission and a budget that was already in place so that's been more of what my conversations have been totally. well thank you guys those are just a few of the questions we, we've had submitted um which is great although we are just gonna shift it back to alicia's way because she's got another question for you <laughs> yeah, just as as we kind of touched on in that last answer of how things have shifted quite drastically in the past month or so, um, I'm just curious what it's been like collaborating with these teams of people that you work with, creatives and different corporations and organizations. What's that been like learning to do that and be a producer over Zoom and over video calls when there's not that in-person um, meetings happening. Just, just if you could speak a little bit about what that experience is like. Um, I think it's a really interesting moment that we're in and uh, I'll kick it over to Douglas to start. <laughs> it's been very unique. <laughs> <It's> been very unique. <laughs> um, I, I have to say, you know, the one thing you, you said, I'm not sure I would necessarily agree with when you say 
um, not having these meetings in person because doing a Zoom meeting like this, while I may not physically be able to shake your hand, I do feel like I am connected to you. And that's very important. I think the use of Zoom has really changed the way people kind of see doing business now and possibly into the future. But going back to your question about collaboration specifically, um, I've really found it to be very, very fulfilling to be able to do work like this because not being able to be in a room and point to a storyboard or talk about the script and point to a specific line to somebody causes you to be much more detail oriented in your communication, whether it is through email or if it's a, a Zoom call like this, you start becoming very self-conscious about making sure you have relayed all the information and all of your expectations, as well as managing everyone else's expectations to make sure that you can make a successful event happen. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great point. Does anyone else have anything to add on that front, Coleman? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll add, um, I mean, our kind of like, um, our keys to success in um, collaboration online right now have been, of course, Zoom, like everyone, but um, we're a Slack company, which I know people have mixed feelings about, but I love Slack. Um, so we started using Slack like uh, a year ago, and, um, and, and we had just gotten into the groove of like how we work with Slack and in the office and communicate, and then this hit us, and now it's, it's been a whole readjustment of how to communicate, right? Because as Douglas said, you have to be more detailed um, in how you communicate, but the infrastructure of Slack has really helped us. Um, and then the other kind of tip I would throw out is Airtable, also a huge Airtable fan. So like we've ditched all of the Google Sheets and have moved to Airtable for tracking like how things are progressing down a pipeline. Also big pipeline fan, so we can talk about pipelines, but um, yeah. like talking about each individual project or, or each one of the monologues and seeing, tracking its progress um, even throughout a 24 hour period can be really helpful when you're not in person. So those are our kind of two ways that we've shifted. Yeah, I love those shout outs because we are also here at The Wing, we are big fans of Slack and big fans of Airtable. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could just, you gave a really great overview of what Airtable is, but for those who aren't familiar with Slack, could you give like a real quick, just like, this is a great tool. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> um, so Slack um, for us condenses all of our email and text or Facebook message or whatever else um, communication into one tool, at least um, internally, so that almost all, like 99% of our internal communication about anything 24 hour plays is happening on Slack. Um, we can share documents, you can direct message someone, you can message someone in channels. And um, whether you're a very small team or a very large team, some of our projects are, are very small team oriented. Um, you, you set all of these different channels that are your projects. Um, and then it makes your small team stay organized with all of your different projects. So we can look at um, weeks of monologues in advance and have everything kind of sorted, even a chat message sorted into a box. So it makes it really easy to communicate and find things later. There you go. And I'm not even getting paid for that. So I'm <laughs> throwing that out there. And over to you, Rachel. Good. Um, we also big fans of Slack. We had so many channels and so many hashtags. And also, you know, you end up working these insane hours that sometimes you just need to send your teammates like a very silly gift. Um, and you can do that with Slack too, in addition to all of the various other mm -hmm. ways of communicating. Um, we also used frame.io um, for all of our editing or to share sort of where we were in the process, um, which was helpful because you can have multiple collaborators look at the same thing. Um, but to your question about, you know, how is this different? I feel like so much of the producing I do is done when I'm executive producing or line producing on a computer, on email, I'm working in Google Docs. Google Docs is one of my best friends. And we also used Dropbox a lot to share and upload in particular um, files from talent. Um, so that in many ways felt the same, but we had these, um, we scheduled nightly Zoom check-in calls every single night, um, even if it was just a half hour to get a, an update on where we were at, um, important sort of like next steps that need to be taken. And um, we would all sort of be in this constant communication that Douglas talked about. You have to be very clear and very specific because you're not getting the same cues you would normally. 
Yeah, I feel like that FaceTime is so important uh, during this. Like Zoom has just become such an integral part of just the way this, the theater community, I feel like in particular, communicates is just still having that. We're seeing people still and not just on a traditional phone call, which has been nice. Yeah. All right, on to our next question. Um, so uh, compared to other projects that you've worked on uh, that have been live or in person, um, what was maybe different about how you approached this, your particular program or programs or events? Um, and you know, off the bat, what are some changes you knew you would have to adapt to before moving forward? Or was there anything about the process that was surprisingly similar? I mean, I'll, I'll say at least first that, um, that we didn't we didn't really know. Um, like I said, like our first set of viral monologues, which was intended to be the only set of viral monologues, um, happened very quickly. And um, we knew that we had artists who were looking to get together that Monday and Tuesday to do a podcast, and we couldn't do that podcast. So we now had artists who were ready, um, ready to work, just not in in the same space together. Um, so yeah i I'll, I'll say that that's been like the constant um it, it's been constantly like looking back and going like oh okay so that's kind of how that thing unraveled and now we're planning for the future but um we didn't know we didn't know how people would would receive this kind of media um or or if they would want to or they'd be ready or if artists were ready to kind of share like where we are in this moment with the world and um yeah I'll um, answer too. I mean, the process in some ways is very similar to putting on, it's not like putting on a production um, that needs to su sustain, but it's quite similar to putting on a live event, like a one night only event, except now you also have editors and your timeline has to be um, regulated in such a way to plan for all the various uploads that need to happen. Um, and so that part of the process felt in, in some ways similar. Uh, I also have to say, and I'm, I'm not sure how other people were feeling, but like at the beginning of quarantine, I like really didn't want to consume any digital theater content. I just, for some reason, it was not in my soul. And um, when Benj asked me to help produce the Seder, I saw it as an opportunity to sort of foster community with with the Jewish people and also in a much more secular way, sort of tell this story that is inherently so theatrical. Um, so it was like a sneaky way for me to do a piece of theater in a moment where I wasn't feeling like I wanted to make any theater, if that makes sense. And now I've sort of come around and I'm, I'm so supportive of everyone doing it. But um, I, I know other folks in our industry have sort of felt that way. Like, if it's not live, do I want to be a part of it? And I, I sort of pushed myself to do it. And I have to say, I, it, it felt very similar to sort of putting on a show and it, I, it felt very fulfilling to do it. And I have to kind of agree with, with both Coleman and Rachel is that things still happen the same way. There are still some processes that go into place. You're still kind of looking at your schedule. You're still trying to figure everything. You're mapping it out the way you normally would an event. But like Rachel was saying, if you really step back to when quarantine first started, I think the biggest thing that we had, at least around the office, we kept saying, the community wants to do something now. We didn't know how long this was gonna last. We thought, okay, maybe it's a week, two weeks, who knows? But the community instantly knew when Broadway shut down, we've gotta do something to help and we've gotta do it now. So everybody was coming at us at once. So much like Coleman, it was kinda like, what do we do? You know, it was, you were kind of lost. You were, you were in this world that you didn't really quite understand necessarily. And I kind of equate it to a baby giraffe. It's like, we were just learning how to get up on our legs. We were just figuring it out. And now I feel like we're that majestic animal, just like, you know, we've learned how to do it and we're still continuing to learn, which is great. Um, but it's really been a learning process for all of us. And I think for everybody who wants to engage with us, it's been a learning process for them. And that's what I appreciate is that we're all on the same curve of this learning process that we can, we can kind of help each other and really elevate whatever we're producing. Yeah, I'll also add to that. There were so many people involved in the Seder and um, you know, the day of the Seder, which was April 11th, 
Um, I remember our writers went to bed at like 6 a.m. because they had watched a cut and then they went to sleep. We got the second cut, the producers woke up in the morning, worked on that and sort of like sent off the final and it all just felt so um, similar to working on a live event where you don't know what's gonna happen and it's a little bit of chaos and like you, then you get pushed out on stage and um, I did feel though, while we were watching that final cut, I felt like, oh, these songs are sort of stuck in my head. I, I think it's gonna be good. <laughs> They're definitely stuck in mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's one other thing too, just real quick, is the difference between what we're doing now and doing a regular live event is, even though the event happens, there's a little bit of a letdown from an event side, I'd say, from producing side, because there's some sort of fulfillment that happens when you're in the theater or you're in that space, and it and you you feel that that audience, you hear that laughter, you hear that applause, and you're like, oh, this finally came together. It was so perfect. But now we don't have that moment because everything is silent. It's behind a screen. We can only see whatever kind of interactions we're having. How many views are we getting? What kind of press did we get? That's where the fulfillment is coming through. It's a little bit different, but it's, it's shifting the dynamic of what you can consider what is a successful event. And I'll say off of that too, it, it's been exciting to be in a place of unknown and to go off of um, it, it, instincts and, um, and like we're in a place of kind of all bets being off in terms of like, what is theater? So like, um, we get the question all the time, like, are we producing theater? Are we producing film or something? And it's like an academic question, right? But it's interesting, I guess, just to say like, I don't know. And that's why we're doing it. Um, because we know that we can't be doing theater, theater. So we're going to do theater like some other way and pull the essential things that we love ab about that. Um, whether it's like, you know, the kind of like, you just threw something together. Sometimes that's how the edit, the final edit feels like right before it goes. Then you kind of like, like Rachel was saying, you kind of cross your fingers and you're not sure. Um, so that's been exciting because it means that everyone in, in theater is in the same boat. Like we are, we are all at an opportunity at a crossroads to say, what, what, what is next? Like, what are we going to do in this moment together? Um, and I go in and out of wanting to do that. Like Rachel was saying, like some days it's like you, I feel more creative than others and, and feel like more inside of quarantine and then more like outside of quarantine. Um, but yeah. Great. Thank you. And, um, you know, you, we talked about motivation a little bit before or, or just touching around the essence of it. Um, and we have a question uh, from Benjamin Simpson. Um, and just curious to hear your answer for this. So he says, coming from someone who gets motivation from people and the world around us all, how do you stay motivated when we're all stuck inside? Um, and I think that's actually very uh, important to answer. Um, and I'm just curious to hear what you guys have to have to say. Um, it's a great question. And um, for me, it's come from the fact that we're all stuck inside. Like everyone is in the same boat in, in, in a similar way, at least. Um, of course, some have it um, off worse than others, but um, the kind of community that can be brought together, like the fact that artists right now are all quarantined somewhere, the fact that audiences are all quarantined somewhere, like for the 24 hour plays, at least, we're used to doing galas. And I'm always trying to find a way to get more students and more younger people, more like a lower ticket price to get a, a different group of people in to see an event like that. But because it's a gala, that's really difficult. This is that moment. It, this is the moment when we can engage people all around the world, all at the same time. Um, so it's that, like it's um, it, it's seeing the like small Instagram engagement and stuff. That that's what it is for me. And I think it's the same. I mean, I've worked with collaborators on events now who are not New York based, who are not even based in the United States, and um, this opportunity to sort of, you know expand what we think of as our community and work with all of these individuals across the globe and sort of like find our shared interest and our passion, which is like making theater and we're sort of figuring out how to make it online together now. And that to me has been extremely motivating. I mean, you can't produce by yourself. 
So even if, even if you're not in person, the fact that you are connecting with people so much around a shared goal, I find to be um, just a very inspiring thing during this time. Mm -hmm. I think it's in, what keeps me going and motivated is seeing when there are people or organizations that normally would not even crack their door open to us or even think about answering an email are coming to us saying, how do I get involved? Seeing, seeing people really understanding how important this moment in time and history is and that they need to make a difference and impact and create change. And that's really, really you know, motivating. In addition to the fact that because of the work that we do at the Actors Fund, we have clients. So clients actually are writing to us to say, thank you. Thank you for helping me. And even the talent, there are, I can't tell you how many people who are, who are donating their time when I talk to them, they're saying, I'm doing this because you helped me and I, it's time for me to pay it back. And finally, the biggest thing for me is just knowing all the money that we're raising right now really is going out for the entertainment and performing arts community that we have already at this date. Um, I want to say, yeah, I'm looking at my numbers here. It's, I want to say it's about $8.5 million has already been distributed from the Actors Fund. So that's what motivates me. Yeah, that's incredible. And just really, really inspiring to hear, you know, what, what keeps you, keeps you at it and makes you get up in the morning and be like, I'm going to do the work today. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it. Um, and just speaking from my own experience at the wing is just, you know, getting up and being like, I can put something good into the world um, during this time and I can make someone smile is, is really, is, has really been motivating me uh, in my own work just to throw that in as well. And I'll also add that, you know, when this all started, I think we as artists sort of looked around and felt, oh, we're not actually, like, we're not considered essential. Like, we, we're, art making in its way is essential, but mm -hmm. we're not an essential service, and yet how can we sort of use our skill set um, for greater purpose? And so, I mean, all of us have been working on these events that are raising these critical funds that are going towards essential service. And so that in that way has also been extremely inspiring just to Douglas's point. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I personally think that the arts and, and theater specifically are, are going to play essential roles in helping us, you know, overcome the challenges of, of being quarantined and, and the effects thereafter too. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. I really appreciate that, um, those answers. And um, so just jumping back into more audience questions, uh, we've actually got a lot of questions related to this one that I'm about to say. So lots of folks wanna find out. And uh, the specific question comes from uh, Julie, Julie Theobald, who is the president of the Educational Theater Association. And so Julie says, uh, can you talk about the editing process? with these various short segments with celebrities? Uh, how much is envisioned slash planned in advance and how much is seeing what you get and then orchestrating the story? Which is a great question. <laughs> um, I'll go first. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, on an event like the Seder, which was completely pre-recorded and mostly scripted, um, we were in circumstances sometimes where you would hand in uh, talent their script, you'd email it to them. They had 24 hours or more with it. You'd all get on a Zoom um, and or they would just send you a video via face uh, using their iPhone like FaceTime. And um, it wasn't at all what you had written. And they're a celebrity and so you can't necessarily go back to them and say you messed everything up. Um, so how do you, I would say more often than not, it was the latter, sort of taking whatever you get and making it work um, in the editing process. Um, but that's not always the case. There are also talent who, if you give them a script, they will read the script exactly as it is. Um, there are also folks who work better with improv. They want bullet points so that they can feel like more emotionally connected to what they're saying. Um, but I would say more often than not, the editing process is key in that. Yeah, and um, in our case, we receive videos um, from actors at 5 p.m. and we start posting them at 6. Um, 
and we post somewhere from six to midnight. Um, anyone that's ever uploaded a video knows that it, it takes time and it doesn't just happen right uh, when you hit upload. So sometimes we're waiting on actors' videos for like two hours or something and we're editing other ones and then somebody's is still coming through the pipeline. Um, and then sometimes you get one that, right, is, is like, um, you, you had no idea that they were gonna film it that way or they, they got inspired and did something like really amazing, but like outside of what you expected. And then you have to kind of like, okay, so then how do we tailor that for the right, you know, the, to fit what the writer was um, intending. Um, for us, I'm always reading the plays throughout the day and then making detailed notes for our editors and for uh, pulling sound effects and, and video effects, like kind of prepping these videos. And then we get a lot of videos that, um, actors have cleverly edited themselves. One thing I've learned is that self-tape, like the self-tape world apparently has taken over and that actors are amazing at it uh, because all of the tricks and tips and everything that they're using to like make these videos like fully produced content it is incredible. Um, so sometimes you receive that um, and it, it, it can just, it can really vary. Um, so that's kind of the excitement to me. That's one of the most exciting parts. I would say, the short answer is expect the unexpected, always. Because no matter what you give somebody, I always expect them to go rogue. <laughs> you're never, you're never <laughs> gonna get exactly what, I mean, whether it's a line or it's a word or whatever it might be, you're never gonna get exactly what you've written, exactly the way you envision it. Um, so yes, the editing process is key. You do have to create a story around what you get. Um, so that's the short answer. <laughs> I'll also say that like right now, the, um, uh, the way we're digesting media is different. So like um, quality is not the same. Like people aren't looking for the same kind of mastered audio or the same kind of color correction or lighting. So you have something at your advantage that uh, we're constantly weighing, which is like, you know, how, how professional does this need to be to feel like part of our world? And then how like how exciting is it that it's kind of a rough cut too, you know, and that you're seeing someone in their real home really put on a little play. Like that's kind of the fine line. Coleman, I think that goes back to what you originally said, which is we're in a whole new world of creating something new. And it, we don't really know what that's going to be, whether it's this DIY kind of feel or a perfectly polished, edited thing. And that's what's so exciting about what's happening right now. Yeah, and so kind of similar in that vein of kind of like you're, you're treading this unknown new territory, new waters. What skills in your producing arsenal have been particularly helpful as you've switched gears into this new mode of creating and working? And are there any new muscles that you're discovering or old muscles that you haven't flexed in a while that you've called <laughs> upon to help you? Um, I've learned a little bit of lingo and how to talk to editors shorthand. Um, I, one of the things that I hadn't necessarily thought of before, um, although like for a gala, you do have to put this in a run of show, but like, what are the graphic effects? What are the sound effects? Um, and just being really, really, uh, clear about all of the specifics that one line, line item, one segment might need to include. Um, that's been a huge, a huge thing for me, but in terms of skill sets, I think that producing is quite flexible. Um, I, a lot of organization, a lot of strategy and thinking about timeline and really working more backwards than forwards. Um, and if you're working with a partner or a YouTube platform, when do you need to get them to edit? Not when is the event? When is the final edit due to them? <laughs> yeah. That's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, really organization, uh, communication, and uh, just transparency overall, even more so when you are not having the face-to-face -face contact you always need. Um, and I'll add that working remotely and like out for the 24 hour place, I usually work in an office. So working remotely um, also takes a different kind of set of skills as a personal artist, just making sure like, you know, that I'm keeping up somewhat of a routine and um, building my list for the day and like things like that, that um, are, are just harder in like strange times like this. So. Um, I've, I've been stretching those muscles too. I think similar to what Rachel also said was the skill set that you're bringing to it is constantly organization, structure, making sure you, you're, you just really know the vision 
that you're trying to achieve. And I think not even just working backwards, which I completely agree with, but being able to sit back because you're so engaged with everything that's happening right now and all of this new kind of technology that we're all using together. And you're still trying to say, well, how do I make mine stand out from everybody else's? Well, they're all kind of looking the same. Um, so you kind of have to have the ability to have a 40,000 foot view of what it is that you're doing because you can get so caught up in the minutia. And that I think is something that has really resonated with me during this time is to make sure to step back with everything coming at you. I mean, sometimes I say, I feel some days I'm sitting there and I'm drinking from a fire hose because everything is coming at me at once. So you have to kind of just stop, turn off that fire hose and take a look at the overall picture. And that's something, I think that's a muscle that I maybe haven't flexed as much as I usually would. Um, and I've been appreciating the fact that I've been able to do that. I have to say, I try and approach all of my producing with exactly that. I think the producer's job is to be as close to the audience. The actors should be in the trench, or the artists should be in the trenches, the directors, all of the sort of generative folks on a process. And as the producer, you're responsible for ensuring you have your own perspective on what's being made, especially to Douglas's point of how is it different from everybody else? You have to be thinking about that. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, and so you talked a little bit about flexing your muscles <laughs> and, you know, discovering maybe new muscles um, or new skills. Um, and um, so within that vein, and now um, kind of just targeting toward our network audience, our emerging theater administrators who want to continue fl flexing their theater muscles during this time, um, you know, what advice do you have to offer to them uh, considering the circumstances? You know, what is the best way to continue collaborating and exercising their skills? I think this is a little more general, but start making things, you know? I mean, you have an audience now. The audience is everyone who's home. And yes, there's some sort of um, competition for attention in that way, but um, uh, theater without theater was one of the first things that started, which Lily Houghton started. Um, and it was this incredible sort of Instagram account that just brought all these people together. And it was, it was created by early career theater artists in their very early 20s um, and has now evolved and has taken on new shape. But I felt so inspired by what she and her co-founders had done. Immediately, that was their reaction. And I feel like that energy from the young generation is the thing that's sort of keeping us all moving forward. And, and there's so many new ideas coming from, from all of the early career folks. And I still consider myself to be fairly early career. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think on top of that, um, get creative because like now, right now, like we're talking about everyone, we're just having to be creative in, in a wonderful way. It's just the challenge of where we are. Um, so allow that, like allow that, you know, you may find parts of you or things that you, you never really thought you would tap for theater. Now might be the perfect time to tap that part of you. Um, and then I'll say like, pick up the phone or like email or, or message people because everyone is like isolated. So I've found that people are more willing to talk in some way right now. So um, definitely try to reach out to the people that you think you know, you could collaborate with on this because you may be surprised who, who, who will answer you if you've got a cool and unique new app. Yeah. I think, I think exactly what, what both Rachel and Coleman said. It's a matter of don't think you're, you're in this alone. Don't sit in your living room or at your computer with a blank screen going, what do I do next? Talk to people, engage, collaborate, find somebody that you might create a, a project together, something that you have an interest in, and just continue to pursue that creativity, no matter what it is that you're doing, whether it's creating some sort of video content, or you wanna do some sort of crochet competition with your friend. Do something that's gonna let that creative outlet happen, because that's what's gonna help you continue within your theatrical kind of out the skill set that you're going to try to continue to grow and and learn from. So I would I would say just keep doing it and collaborate. Talk to people. Please talk to people. Great. And so 
just to, to wrap it up and, and bring it home, um, if there's one word that you want our audience to take away from today's conversation, um, and I know it went, you know, so more generalized and then specific, but just one word for them to take away, um, what would that word be? Do we get, do we get to explain the word or is it just? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, uh, I would just say now because like now is like your time and all of our time to like make something. So, so now is my word. Don't wait. <laughs> I would say um, curiosity. You know, all, everyone has already made so many incredible, um, so much incredible uh, content online. And what can you do? And what are you going to build off of that? and continue to sort of like ask a lot of questions and think about new ways that we can be sharing this um, work with one another while we're in our homes. Inspiring. I would say because there's so much amazing work out there that's being created right now. And I really urge you to consume as much of it as you possibly humanly can because I know we're all sitting at home and we're like okay let's just watch Netflix or whatever else there is go online look and see what other people are creating look and see what content is there it's going to inspire you you will be inspired by it and hopefully you'll create something that will inspire the next person so that's why I would choose that word Amazing. Well, I think on that note uh, it, we have two minutes till we wrap this up but we just wanted to make sure we tap to it had a little bit of time at the end of this to say thank you so, so much for joining us tonight, for taking time out of your evenings to share these insights and experiences and your wonderful words here at the end with us all. Thank you uh, to our attendees for your questions. They were thoughtful, they were thought provoking and insightful. So thank you for that. Um, we're at the end of this one, but we will have a future meeting uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, be sure to keep an eye on your email and the American Theatre Wing website, as well as our social channels. If you're not following those, uh, there's a lot of content being put out, as well as updates on the network and the upcoming masterclass series that we will be doing. Um, but otherwise, I think that's a wrap on uh, Pivot and Rethink. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we hope you stay safe well and inspired. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>